Greetings and welcome to today's program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Robert Kilpatrick, Chair of the Club's Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum and Chair of this program. It's my pleasure to extend a welcome to any of our new club members, as well as others who are now enjoying our programming fully digitally. Um, the event is being recorded and it will be available uh, in a couple of weeks uh, uh, as a podcast. So without further ado, uh, the program we're gonna hear today is um, called Breakthroughs in Light Medicine, Treating Dementias and Pain. And we're really fortunate to have two uh, expert speakers. Uh, Len Saputo, MD, is, a, is board certified in internal medicine, and he has pioneered the development of integrative, holistic, person-centered, and preventative healthcare model, which he calls health medicine. He founded the Health Medicine Forum and has 20 years of experience working with light therapy and over 50 years practicing medicine. Maurice Bales uh, is an electrical engineer who holds the first U.S. patent and FDA clearance for a light machine. He was awarded five grants from NASA while working on the space shuttle and has been employed by UC Berkeley to mentor PhD students in fusion physics for two decades. So without further ado, I'll hand the program over to Len. Len, hello. Hey, Robbie, thank you so much for doing that. Listen, this is a great opportunity for us to to, to introduce a new era of medicine. We're looking at a way to bring light uh, into our, the practice of medicine. And it does things that I never would have suspect, suspected when I went to medical school. But that all changed when I met Maurice Bales. Maurice has been uh, an inspiration for me and he has a background in physics that you need to be able to do this uh, kind of medicine. And when we initially met, it was very interesting because I was reading kind of what I call a throwaway, throwaway medical journal, and it had an ad in there that talked about what light did. And I looked at it and thought, oh, sure, if that's really true, then everybody would be using light because it says it does all these incredible things. And I was about to throw it out, and I noticed that he lived, his phone number was in the same area code as mine. And so I thought, well, I'll just give him a call because at the time I was interested in integrative medicine, I thought I should pursue all the things in integrative medicine that I can because I'm an integrative practitioner. So I call up Maurice and I introduce myself and he kindly says, thank you. And why did you call? And I told him what I read and I said, it sounds like it's baloney to me, Maurice. Uh, it's, it just sounds too good to be true. And he said, you know, you sound like everybody else. Uh, you, you got the same thought that it's too good to be true. And so you don't even want to take a look at it. I said, well, you got a point there. So we decided that we would get together. He invited me to bring over a couple of patients to his office and uh, he would show me what he would do with light. Well, one of the patients had multiple sclerosis and he got out of his bed and managed to get over to his office and Maurice treated him for about 15 minutes. And as the man walked in, he was all hunched over it. And you could see he was in pain. He was grimacing with every step. And in 15 minutes, he was almost upright. And he had a big smile on his face. And he said, what did you just do to me? It's amazing. And so with that, we treated the second patient. He got better too. And then Maurice looked at me and he said, do you want to do more of this? And I said, Sure. So he says, well, why don't we get together for the next couple of months? You bring some patients over between five and seven on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, bring two or three patients and we'll treat them and you see what happens. Well, I brought all kinds of patients over there. And over that period of time, nearly all of them got better. And at the end of it, he said, gee, what do you think now, Mr. Smart Guy? And all I could say is, thank you, Maurice. How did you feel about that, what we went through, Maurice? Well, I thought it was an opportunity to uh, show our new technology. Uh, at the time, we were uh, using our thermal imager to, uh, to, to look at the blood flow uh, of the patient and using the, uh, the light uh, to uh, change the blood flow and uh, that reduce the pain on the patient. 
And so what you really invented here was a system that nobody else was using. In fact, hardly anybody was using light therapy to begin with. And so with the system you devised, you have a, a, a camera, an infrared camera that measures the light that the body emits. And there are patterns that are typical, that are characteristic of each kind of illness that you see. And you can see in real time as you split the screen, where you have, and we'll show you this on some images as we progress through this program. You have an image on one side that's fixed, that's the, the starting image. Then in real time, you're treating and you're looking at the thermal changes that you see in the skin. And they are characteristic of different kinds of things like back pain with sciatica or somebody who has dementia or somebody who has heart disease or any kind of, of condition that has pain. And so that brought another level into the sophistication of what this uh, technology is all about. So you did something that was really special. Now, how did you get started with this, Maurice? How did you get into infrared technologies to begin with? I, uh, I was working at UC Berkeley and uh, they asked me to take a grant with NASA Ames. And I took that grant and uh, I was helping with the surface science uh, materials for the space shuttle. And uh, uh, I designed a system so that they could image uh, and do mass spectroscopy on the samples mm -hmm. because they wanted a cheap, uh, they wanted uh, cheap materials for, for the space shuttle. So I made these systems for them so they could do that. And uh, Dr. Popa from NASA uh, asked, told me that if I would make one more instrument for him, that, uh, that he would introduce me to people that used uh, the same kind of instruments as I was operating in his system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I made that instrument for him, and I got a call from Silicon Valley, and they asked me to make instruments for them. And uh, then they had a thermal imager that they had purchased the rights to, and it, it had problems. And they asked me to redesign a whole new thermal imager that uh, would be better than anything on the market. And so we, we made a 12-bit system. And uh, we had a group of orthopedic surgeons call us and ask if we would make a program for them. And that's how we actually started in the medical. Right. And then you started using it on people and you saw all these changes as you were putting infrared light back into the body that made people feel different. And so what we're going to do now is review some of the story of how this developed and what it's progressed into. And it does some rather, it, it does things that are shocking. It's so shocking that it's hard for people to actually comprehend that this new technology is real. And yet there are thousands and thousands of papers out there now, uh, many of them out of the best research centers in the country from Harvard and Boston University and the Boston VA, and now all over the country, all over the world. So there are doctors in many different countries now, and the US included, that are starting to use this technology. So it's really a great opportunity for us to show you uh, how this is, is something that we can do. So I have a PowerPoint here that I'd like to find because it's not showing up. There it is. And this is what the talk is about. And what we have is we have to talk about what, what kind of light are we talking about? There are lots of names for the same thing. All these names that you see on the screen are the same thing. And, and what they show is uh, a is names like photonic stimulation, low-level light therapy, photodynamic therapy, uh, photobiomodulation. They're all the same thing. They're not lasers, they're LEDs. So what I'm trying to do here is find this PowerPoint uh, on here, which is escaping me. And it's, it is escaping me, so I have to find where it went. Well, while, while you're finding it, uh, let me just uh, explain that the, the first treatment devices that we started with were uh, all infrared uh, wavelengths, and so you can't see infrared, but, uh, but you can see the changes on the thermal imager 
that was uh, focused on the patient. But uh, over the over the time, we found that uh, I guess that blue light would really uh, add a lot to the equation because blue light has a lot more energy. And uh, so we started uh, making uh, machines that had blue light and infrared light. And Dr. Saputo and I tested those machines. And actually we tested them on our own families uh, before we tested them on anybody else. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, the first machine is actually like mid nineties. So it was a long, long time ago. And uh, we had that approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And one of the first patients that we had, uh, this uh, was with a group of doctors on the East Coast, uh, was a lady that uh, had, had had breast cancer and her husband was a physicist that worked for Brookhaven Labs. And uh, he, he had his wife go in for treatment uh, for, uh, for radiation they set the, uh, the uh, source uh, 10 times higher than they were, should have, and they burned the lady, and uh, all of her uh, chest area was weeping, and she had terrific pain all the time. And so we used this first, uh, first machine on, on her, our first light therapy device, and uh, it was the only thing that stopped the pain. And actually, the weeping actually stopped after two treatments. And so I had made just two prototypes. And the, uh, the uh, physicist asked if, if they could take one of the prototypes. And I told them, yeah, you can take it for a week. And, uh, but I need it back because I only have two of them. So anyway, what happened after a week, there was no return. And so I, I called him. And he told me, he said, uh, I, can't, I can't send it back. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, it's the only thing that helps my wife, so I'm not going to send it back. So I said, okay, and then I only had one prototype. <laughs> That's what we've seen with so many patients is that same story. And all of it stems from light. And when you think about it, light from the sun is, I mean, it makes it possible for life on Earth. All you, what you're seeing in this picture here would not be present, nor would there be any animal life. Light is what actually gives, gives us the ability to function. And there are different ways that you can use light that we are uh, inv involved with. And these are all the light waves that are put out by the sun. And the light that we use is all safe life. It doesn't use any ionizing radiation like X-rays or gamma rays. It uses visible light in the red and blue uh, spectrum, and it also uses infrared. And that is the basis for a real safe, economically simple thing uh, to use. So we started with uh, using devices 20 years ago that didn't have a whole lot of power, and they, and they didn't have a whole lot of different wavelengths in them. But what's happened since that time, Maurice? Well, since that time, uh, as I alluded to, uh, what we've done now is uh, our device, uh, devices have, are multispectral. They have like eight different wavelengths of light that actually mix together and make a lot more different wavelengths. So we cover pretty much the infrared and visible wavelengths with, uh, except for the grain. Um, the device on top the, is a 400 milliwatt. That's the original one and it was 880 nanometers, which is uh, infrared. And the bottom one is our current uh, design, which we have made for us. Uh, it's the only one in the world. And uh, you can see it's from 400 milliwatts to 37,000 milliwatts. And uh, if it were all just infrared, that would be way too much power, the 37,000, and uh, you would burn somebody. But because it's multispectral, uh, it works, uh, the power is okay, and you don't burn anybody, and, and it, does, uh, uh, it does a lot with all different kinds of tissues. Each type of uh, emitter wavelength does a different uh, thing, uh, helps different tissues. If you turn on the blue, 
and shine the uh, emitter in your mouth, it lights up your teeth kind of a peach color. But if you, tur if you, but if you turn off the blue and turn on the infrared, it doesn't light up the teeth. So see the teeth need the higher energy uh, to, to, and only the teeth that are alive light up. All, all the other ones will just be white. And then you get these nice peach colored teeth for the ones that are alive. It's amazing. Yeah, now you've done some other things with light too. Uh, you you have a system that delivers almost any any wavelength that you want within the spectrum that we're talking about, looking at blue and red and infrared. And that's something that hasn't been done by other people. It's like an invention that you made. Tell us, uh, what does that actually do? How, how, what kind of, how many frequencies can you make? Or how many wavelengths can you make? Well, we're actually covering that whole uh, almost the whole wave, the, all the, the, the whole spectrum, uh, the visible spectrum and the infrared spectrum. Now we also modulate this light uh, to try to uh, get rid of pathogens, and that's something else that we're really not going to discuss. But uh, it's in the research phase right now, and so there. What you see on this slide now is all the other devices that. He, that Maurice invented or, or has, has gotten a hold of that help us to identify the, the uh, resonant frequencies uh, of different organisms. And that probably has a future, but uh, that, that's in the future. This slide uh, actually shows what happens uh, when you shine different wavelengths of light on, uh, on a person or on a skin. What happens is there, there's water vapor that, or water that blocks, uh, say, from a little over 900 nanometers to uh, 1050. So if you were using emitters that em emitted at that wavelength, it would, would do nothing because the water would uh, just absorb it. And on the left side, uh, the, you, you can see the blood uh, absorbs most of the red. Uh, the, so if you, uh, this doesn't show all the wavelengths that we do. It, it doesn't show the blue, which is down uh, from 400 to 500 nanometers. So this is a better, uh, this is a, a wavelength chart of actually all of the different wavelengths that the uh, emitters emit. And there's uh, two, uh, there's actually three blue ones. That's on the left side and then in the middle are the red, three reds, and then on the right are the two infrareds. But they make uh, wavelengths, uh, other wavelengths, uh, like if you turn on the blue and the red, you get magenta also. So uh, they're, the whole, whole band is covered. The point here is it's pretty complicated physics. And what we're doing is putting light that do, of different wavelengths and frequencies does, that, it, that does different things in different tissues. What might affect the brain might not affect the heart, might not affect the muscles or the pancreas. And we're learning more about that as we're doing more research. One of the things that, well, you can talk about that one, Maurice. Well, this is really interesting. If you are in a dark room and you just use the blue light and you uh, shine the blue light on your skin, what happens is your skin glows red and blue light does not make red light, but it's your body that actually makes the, uh, the, the the red light. Right. Now, what does the light do? There, is, uh, there's, there are thousands of papers that talk about this. And what the light does, for, for starters, is it increases the blood flow instantly. There's a chemical called nitric oxide that everybody's talking about that is important in dilating blood vessels. So as soon as that light hits a blood vessel that, constrict, that is constricted, it dilates it. So you're increasing blood flow. It also activates stem cells and makes them migrate to the area where there's damage in the body. So we'll show you a slide eventually where we're looking at uh, stimulating the, the actually the sacrum and mesenchymal stem cells from there in people who have Alzheimer's disease will receive those uh, stem cells and start to do work that gets rid of the tangles and plaques. It's pretty amazing. It increases the production of energy, which is a, the basic illness or the basic problem we have in every illness we have. There's a failure in production of ATP, which is the energy currency of the body. Gasoline runs a car, ATP runs your body. And when you don't have enough energy, the, sales, the, the cells fail. 
If you can increase that production of energy, which this light does, by up to 75%, you can restore function in, in, in tissues all over the body, including the brain. And we'll get to that in a little while. It reduces inflammation. It stimulates the production of collagen. It increases swollen tissues that are edematous. Uh, it kills microbes. We've talked about that a little bit, Mike, uh, Maurice did. And we'll see that it actually has an effect on the coronavirus, which might be of interest to, to a lot of people today, as well as things like MRSA infections that are, are prominent in hospitals today. It increases the rate of tissue repair for sports injuries by about 50%. And we can use it even treating cancers now. Some of the major universities are starting to use what's called photodynamic therapy to treat cancer. It's beyond the scope of this presentation, but you should know about it. It boosts immunity. It reduces the excitability of nervous tissue. Uh, and it's the nerves that cause pain. So this is a very powerful way of relieving pain. And we'll get to that in a little while. Now, Maurice has come up with another effect that's not been discussed in the literature that I think we want to bring to your attention today called the photoelectric uh, effect. And it's, a, it's something that Einstein discovered when, when uh, well, Mark, why don't you tell us about it real quickly, Maurice? Well, um, what I have to say is uh, when, when you use the, uh, the uh, stimulator to uh, stimulate the nerves, what happens with many uh, patients is they get an immediate response. And uh, the immediate response is like somebody that has diabetic neuropathy and, and you shine the light on their feet, they may not have been able to feel their feet for five years. And in a minute or two minutes, the person a lot of times can feel their feet. Yeah, and the pain disappears as and, well. And the pain disappears as well. And uh, I know that the light uh, makes a lot of changes in the ATP and nitric oxide, how that all works. But I also believe that the light directly uh, gives energy to the electrons that, uh, that conduct on, on the sheath of the nerve. And, and I believe that it's a direct effect. And uh, nobody's really talked about that. We had one time a, a fellow with uh, a patient with ALS, and he couldn't move at all. And we we treated him, and he could move his legs out of the wheelchair. That's after uh, like a ten minute treatment. Yeah. So, you know that it's not healing uh, the ALS, but it but it's it allows the patient to to get some mobility back and some quality of life. And it does it for a lot of neurological conditions that we'll talk about. These are the kinds of conditions you want to talk about. It's used, this light is used to manage pain. It's used for neuropathies, for lots of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and traumatic brain injuries, uh, for different kinds of infections. A lot of viruses respond to this very nicely. We talked about cancer and photodynamic therapy. And then there are some specific uh, uh, things that it can do for various tissues like the eye that we, if we have time, we'll get into. For pain management, these are the kinds of pictures that we see when we do the infrared imaging. And what you're looking at here is, and it's hard to see, is someone's back. Just assume where all that red stuff is, is the back. And below it are the, is a picture of the feet. And that jumped ahead. Picture of the feet that uh, shows you how things change. Describe what you have there, Maurice, what you, how you interpret. We have uh, three different sets of uh, photos here, infrared photos from the camera. The left one, the red and white area shows that it's a failed back. It's, it's uh, nerves that are really unhappy and tissues that are unhappy. The person has a lot of pain. And then, so that's before treatment. And then the middle image is several treatments later. And uh, you can see how the changes from the back actually, because the nerves go from the back down to the feet, how the, it changes the pattern in the feet. And you can see that a lot of that red is gone out of that middle image. And then the, at the end of the treatment uh, time, after five treatments, the, the, uh, the right hand upper photo is the, the picture of the person's lumbar spine. And look at, down at the feet, how the feet now have, uh, they look both the same and the, the patterns are equal and the person is without pain. Yeah, this is a dramatic thing. And 
And I want to show you that. This is actually a movie that's a five-minute movie, and we're not going to spend five minutes on it. I'm going to take you through what this does uh, over this period of time. These are the pictures of a back, okay? The one on your left is a picture that's the original picture, and it's going to stay there to show you what it's like from the beginning. The one on the right is going to show, I'm going to show you in real time, and it is going to change as we treat. And as you follow the area in the low back, you can see there are changes in the right that are happening in seconds. So I'll, I'll move this along a little faster so you can see uh, what these changes are. This is at about 38 seconds. It already looks a whole lot different than the one we had before. Now we get a little further into it at a minute and a half. And there are dramatic changes that you see here. Uh, we go out to three and a half, or two and a half minutes. And again, it looks improved again. And by the time we get out here at four minutes, it's almost gone. And by the end of the picture, you have something that's close to a normal back. That's in five minutes. Show me a technology that can do that. And this person had pain. It's a 61-year-old lady who had sciatica. And when the treatment was done, the pain, pain in the back was gone. The sciatica was dramatically reduced. And over a period of, a, of about 10 days, this person was close to pain-free and running and having a normal life. This is another picture of one of my patients who had problems with a lot of pain in her neck and headaches. You can see all the red stuff that's in the, in the picture on the left. And in 15 minutes, it turned to what we see on the right. The headache is gone. Usually we can relieve headaches in three or four minutes, which is hard to believe, but I've been doing this for 20 years now, thanks to Maurice's technology. And I have a lot of people who came in with headaches who don't have headaches now. And over a period of about three weeks, this person got considerably improved. There's a, this is just a, a paper that was written. It was published in The Lancet in 2009 that looked at 820 patients and, and reviewed 16 randomized placebo-controlled studies and their conclusion was that the reduction in pain was dramatic. So there's scientific basis for what I'm reporting to you. Now, this is reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Most of you probably don't know what this is, but when you have an injury to an ankle or a foot or an arm or something like that, the whole nervous system shuts down and, and you have what's called sympathetic maintained pain. And these people are absolutely miserable. They can't walk. Some of them wind up in wheelchairs because it can spread to all the limbs of the body. And in this particular person, because we know it's the sympathetic nervous system, which is in the back, in the in our backs, uh, what we did is we treated the back where we found abnormal heat. And what we saw were the changes that you see from this cold foot on the left to a foot that warmed up and the RSD disappeared. We had another case because we, we go once or several, a couple of times a year to Gary Null's place in Texas where he has a retreat where he has 40 or 50 patients there. And tell, tell us about the patient you treated that, that was in a, uh, a train wreck and she had her wrist amputated and she was having lots of trouble, trouble with pain. Well, she, she didn't know that she had uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. She, she had uh, gone to the doctors and they had done a surgery or two on her, uh, on her arm and she was just miserable. And when we imaged her, we could see right away that it was uh, called non-dermatonal. It means it affected all the, the nerves and all the tissue. And it was really cold. It was like five degrees colder than the room temperature. And Lynn and I uh, used the treatment device and the infrared camera, treated her for just, it, it was like five minutes. Five minutes, yeah. And, and the whole thing changed and, and the RSD went away. And, and uh, this pain, by the way, the RSD pain, uh, I had one patient tell me at the Cleveland Clinic, that it's just like if you have a toothache, but you have a toothache in every every tooth in your head. Yeah, it's terrible. That's the kind of pain it is. So, And there's no real quick or, or effective treatment in mainstream medicine. It takes no, months. No. That's if you could do it. And this happens in minutes a yeah. lot of the time. Yeah. Or maybe it'll take even a couple of weeks, but it's it's a, an amazing thing. We know can we you can use it in rheumatoid arthritis, and I wanted to show you an article that was written on that. I have a patient myself who has rheumatoid arthritis, and he is the most miserable, pain, painful person 
Uh, he, his hands were probably three times the size of what normal is. His knees were that way as well. And he's had about five treatments now. He couldn't, he couldn't get out of a chair without severe pain. And now he's starting to walk a little bit. It's just amazing. And there are many other kinds of arthritis that respond as well. We also know that you can use this thing for people who have had surgery postoperatively. And in this particular study that was, was published in the mainstream journal for light, uh, they, they showed that you could treat the overall pain in people who are moderate to severe and they have only mild to moderate pain afterwards. And I think Maurice, you know someone who's been using this in Southern California for uh, patients pre and post operatively and the results have been really kind of stellar. Yes, uh, the, the, the doctor uh, bought five instruments from us and he put them in the recovery room of the hospital. And every time he, he was a surgeon, every time that he operated on somebody, he treated them before and then he treated them after. And after he started doing that, he, he didn't have one patient that, uh, that ended up with RSD. Now, we talked about diabetic neuropathy you did earlier, and these are some slides of somebody who has uh, diabetic neuropathy. Maurice, why don't you describe what you see here? Okay, the top, uh, the top image, uh, it's difficult to see the, uh, the plantar at the bottoms of the feet, but the upper image shows pre-treatment, uh, and then on the dorsal feet is on the right. Uh, so... Anyway, uh, there's very little bud perfusion because uh, it's cold. That's what the infrared camera is showing us. And then this is after one treatment the, uh, on the bottom, the plantar feet again, show the thermal patterns coming back and uh, both on, on the bottom of the feet and the top of the feet. Yeah, this is when you're treating somebody with diabetic neuropathy, and I've treated a ton of people who have it. Almost all of them, they get better in 15 minutes or 10 minutes, something like that. The, the numbness improves, the pain usually disappears, the balance improves, and it stays. If you do it four or five days or maybe even for uh, two weeks, it'll be good for weeks to months to years. And, and some of my patients come back uh, periodically uh, for that every a year or so for a little tune-up for a day or two. Then there are a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. And the question is, how much light do you need? And this poor dog that is uh, kind of <laughs> just put there because it's a little funny to see. We don't need that much light. That, that's for sure. So how much do you need? Well, it depends on where you shine the light. If you put it on the skull, you know the skull is pretty thick and it's hard to get light to go through that. Uh, but we know that there are areas that where there isn't so much skull. Like if you shine it in the eye, you might think, oh, I'm not putting that thing in my eye because it may be a problem. But I'll tell you. I've treated a number of people with low level uh, levels of infrared light only. I don't use bright light and I don't use a, a lot of light whose vision has, has become rest restored. People with visual field defects, they're gone in like 15 seconds. It's hard to believe it can wake up the retina to be able to do that. So if you shine it in the eye and you shine it up the nose, which is what that literature is talking about now, that's where there's thin bone or no bone at all. And you can get that right into the brain. So it depends on where you treat for the kind of effect that you're going to see. So that may explain why some of the research outcomes are a little bit different and why you have to have a device that can get enough power into the brain, which is what we found is, is important. So that's how yeah, that one, works. One thing I'd like to add, uh, we don't recommend that uh, anybody shine light in their, in their eye unless they go to the uh, doctor or physician that, uh, that directs them. Oh, all this should be supervised by a doctor. This is not something to be used uh, just indiscriminately by, and unless you're an expert in it. Now, what are the kind of, of dementias that, or of, of brain diseases can we treat? Certainly Alzheimer's and other dementias, Parkinson's disease, MS, ALS. Uh, we treat traumatic brain, uh, brain injuries, strokes, and some psychiatric disorders, depression, anxiety, and, and uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And it's this was a surprise to us, really, because we didn't expect it. I remember when we were treating somebody uh, to start with, with the new machine that you made, Maurice, this was three years ago, and we were in Texas, and it was a demonstration uh, that other people were watching. And there was a man that was 90, 93 years old, I think, at the time. Yeah, 93. 
And he walked slush, slouched over. He had a shuffled gait. His head was down. I don't know if he was drooling or not, but he could have been. And we, we had never used this on anybody with Alzheimer's before. And as we did that, we saw over 15 minutes, he just brightened up. He started walking. It was almost like dancing. He said, I feel like dancing. And he was told us he used to be an electrical engineer. And Maurice and I just fell off our chairs. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. And we treated him in subsequent years. And now he's 96 years old. And the last time we saw him, we talked philosophy. Now, you don't see everybody making recoveries like that. But you see most people making changes that are fairly impressive. And the mechanism of action is to increase blood flow, which increases oxygenation. It gets rid of a lot of the inflammation. It stimulates nerves to regrow. And it, and it tends to make the dendrites grow too, which are the little denticles that, that go out from the, and connect with other nerves. And I'm going to show you a, in a minute another picture of what that looks like in, in cells. In, in Alzheimer's disease, Everybody pretty much who's in science knows that there are tangles and plaques and, and it's caused by damage to the brain from oxidative stress or mitochondria that don't work or their abnormal brain rhythms. These are the kinds of things that you see and the, and the response that we get happens so fast. We did one of our own studies. Uh, uh, Mar Maurice's son, uh, Martin, uh, has a company and, and he looked at 10 patients who had dementia with dementia with infrared light and treat them for four weeks. And what they found at the end of that after doing cognitive testing is that they were about 35% better. Now show me some technology in medicine uh, that involves drugs that does anything like that and, and, and you'll, be, you'll be a rich man. That, that hasn't happened yet. So we're very impressed what it does for that. So when you, I, I mentioned this earlier, when you shine light on a rat that has Alzheimer's disease and you shine it on their sacrum, on their low back, in the back, there are mesenchymal stem cells there that get activated by the light that actually travel through the tissues and they go to the brain where they make a lot of these beta amyloid and, and tau tangles disappear. And it starts working in hours after you have done this. So what we're looking at is something that's almost miraculous. This is a slide I wanted to show you. This is a picture of cells from a rat that has Alzheimer's disease. The two on the left are just different blow-ups, different uh, strengths of microscopic uh, blow-up that can show you the cells. And you can see that those cells are circular. They don't have anything, no axons or dendrites that you can see. And if you use low-level light over the tissue cultures of these cells, over five days, you start to see things that you can't believe. All the dendrites start uh, growing and they start becoming normal. So they can take us, uh, they can take people who have these problems and actually cause a, a lot of change. Now, these are studies that I want to show you very quickly that talk about uh, what can be done using light for Alzheimer's disease. And this study came out of Harvard. It was done by Michael Hamlin, who, is a, uh, who has worked there for many years and is one of the pioneers in light therapy. And we know that there aren't any drugs that, works, that work, but we know that using light, particularly red and infrared in this particular study, show that you can relieve pain, inflammation, and you can prevent tissues from dying. That's the big thing in Alzheimer's disease. And so what they did is they put together a number of studies that were done on this, uh, and they showed that uh, people who had dementias were recovering. So that's a big deal. In another study, it was, it was called Turning the Lights On uh, to, for Neurodegeneration. And the article, again, was done uh, by people who published in a major journal for neuroscience. And what they found is that we know we have to have neuroprotection for these cells that are dying. And we know that red light and, and especially infrared light, because it penetrates so deeply and has enough power, uh, it, you can have a treatment that works. So these people actually came to think that this would be worth trying in anybody who has Alzheimer's or Parkinson's because it's safe and it works pretty well. Then in another study, which I want to go over quickly, was done by all the big shots in this country from Harvard and from Boston University and from uh, uh, Toronto, Canada, 
They they treated people over a period of 12 weeks, and what they saw in the patients who had these uh, dementias is that they there was a big improvement in function, uh, and, and they slept better. They didn't have so many outbursts of anger uh, or anxiety, and they weren't wandering. And they saw these declines in just four weeks of treatment. So they were recommending, again, in this study, that it's a good idea to do this to treat people who have these problems. So... In our experience in treating Alzheimer's, we found that using older devices worked. And so the ones with minimum power work surprisingly well. And and I think that's probably because there are light channels in the skull and in in the body through which they're like fiber optics that allow light to pass through the skull, even when it's in low dose. But to use a bigger dose of light is even better. So that's the major point I want to make with that slide. This is a young man who was 22 years old who had a traumatic brain injury. And this is a special kind of electroencephalogram. It's called an EEG that shows the interconnections of the brain. And you can see on the, on the left side, there are not very many interconnections made by the brain. These are the red lines that you see that are going from one point to another. And what they did is they treated him one time with low levels of infrared light. And look at all the connections. And that happened in, in 25 minutes. So we're, we're seeing evidence here that the light is doing things that we can measure. In patients who have traumatic brain injuries, uh, Margaret Nesser, uh, is a, I think she works at Boston University, showed that when we treat people over six weeks, and, they, and I think they used 18 sessions, there was improvement in executive function and the ability to learn with words, for memory recall, for sleep, for PTSD, for social, social interaction, and even things they could do with their jobs. I have one person who had Alzheimer's disease that is a retired police officer. When he came to me, he was really losing his memory. He couldn't remember. He couldn't drive a car uh, safely, and he was just confused. And we used, this was several years ago, a weak device because it was before we had the device that Maurice made. And it made a big difference in him over a period of about six weeks. He went back to driving his car, and he's doing normal life functions. It's it's just a small miracle. Now, for traumatic brain injuries and strokes, this has also been effective. And, and, as it, and it's really just my wanting to show you another article that was done by Michael Hamblin from Harvard University that says that you can do a lot with light to help people with traumatic brain injuries and with strokes. Now, we've treated a number of people with, with multiple sclerosis. And one in particular, Maurice, I'll just kind of introduce it. We were given a talk, and this was, again, in Texas at Gary Knoll's place. And there was this kid that was, I guess, in his late 20s who had had MS for eight or nine years. And he was in his wheelchair, and he was his arms were shaking, his legs were shaking, and he had nystagmus. His eyes were going back and forth. He couldn't read. He couldn't put food in his mouth without it going all over the place. And as I looked at him, I thought, and I looked at Maurice, and I said, we, we're not going to be able to treat him. This is just asking too much. Well, what happened? What did you do, Maurice, and what happened? What happened is uh, when we we treated him for about 20 minutes, and uh, all the shaking stopped. And it's the first time in eight years that he could touch his face. And his mother was there, and she just started crying. She cried for two hours. And uh, we were there for several days, and we gave him uh, – uh, Daily treatment, daily uh, help with the with the uh, with the system, and he was able to feed himself and sleep better and do some of the things that by himself that he had relied on other people to do. And uh, they purchased a home unit from us, and uh, he's just uh, over the last several years he's improved even more. Uh, we're hoping that after this COVID that we can. Uh, see if we can activate uh, some stem cells and get him out of the wheelchair. Yeah, that would be amazing. But he's improved and and dramatically so. I mean, he he went from not being able to function. He couldn't even read because his eyes were going all over the place. But that was a great story. Then we treated a couple of girls there that were in their early 20s. And one of them was a cheerleader. And she couldn't do her cheerleading because she didn't have any balance. So she tried to take baby steps with one foot in front of the other. She'd either fall over or or she couldn't maintain her balance. And this was that first time that we treated the 93-year-old man. We had our machine there for the first time. 
and we and we decided to put it on her too. And so we did our normal treatment for what we do for the brain. And in 15 minutes, she could stand on one foot and put the other foot out behind her with her hands spread out. We just about fell off our chairs again. It was really amazing. And the other young lady who had it that came another time had lots of pain and, and, and dysfunction, and we treated her as well, and that got better. And I have a patient who's an acupuncturist who's had it for probably 40 years. His neuropathy is, is controllable. His back pain is controllable. And it doesn't cure the disease, but it does a lot to make people function a lot more normally. We can use it for infections. And this is probably interesting because there's a lot of pneumonia going around with COVID now. And this is a study that showed that when you use the light on people who are elderly who have pneumonia, it makes a big difference in how they are. It improves their clinical status, their respiratory function, pulmonary blood flow. And they, they use this and the authors came to the conclusion that it should be used for the rehabilitation of elderly patients with pneumonia across the board. Not a bad idea. And I do that for my patients who are like that. And uh, oh, this is not the one I want. Let's try this. Light can be used for coronavirus infections, at least we think. And now this is preliminary information, but we know we can treat viruses. Maurice, we, you discovered this when you had a cold. What, what did you do? Well, a lot of times uh, there's a, there, people recommend different things. On the first sign that you're getting sick, you, you know, take a lot of vitamin C or there's all kinds of different uh, concoctions that people take that uh, ward off the person from getting sick. They feel better the next day. But very, very few people, uh, when you're really sick, if you have a, the, the cold, the, 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 everything is running, the nose is running, and you feel miserable, your eyes are running, and you turn on that blue light and put it in your mouth and up your nose and around your forehead. And your neck. And your neck. And what happens, the cold stops. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you just one treatment. You, you should treat for several days. I mean, several times, you know, one time, one day, and then next day or whatever, but it makes a, it makes the, the cold a lot shorter. Right. There's some preliminary information to suggest because Corona is a virus that it too would respond the same way. And there are a couple of anecdotal reports that suggest it's worth a try. And somebody who has real coronavirus infections You'd be remiss if you had this technology not to use it. I think it's it's something that will be uh, more common in the future. The light treatment for cancer, I'm not going to do because there's just too much involved with that. That's and we don't have enough time. But there is some uh, evidence that it works on the heart pretty well. And this is a very interesting slide of a man who is in his 90s who has heart disease. That I've been treating his heart with light. And you can see that there's a lot of red over the left side and in the left slide on the left side of the body over the chest. And if you look carefully up over the eye, there is a green spot that's on the right side of the on the left side of your slide. And the right side looks much different. That cold spot is something that people know is associated with heart disease. I don't know why. But in this particular case, what I did is I treated this man with light over his eye, not in his eye, over his eye where that was. And look what happened to the image over the chest. It just totally changed. I didn't put the light near his chest, just on the eye. That tells me that it's possible that what's happening here is we're on an acupuncture meridian point for the heart that's making a difference in, in what's happening there. And that's just an interesting aside. That's an anecdotal report. This slide I'm only showing, don't even try to look at it, just look at the at conclusion, but what, it, what it's doing is treating the heart in people who have had uh, stents put in or have had open heart surgery. And what their conclusion was is if you use that light, uh, that you will make people get better. And I'll just leave that at that and show you what the next slide shows. With If you compare it to the drugs that are used for heart disease, it's about equivalent to it. Uh, and it's, it improves contractility and cardiac output. Uh, and people are talking about using it in people with congestive heart failure, which I've done, and a few people have seen good results. 
Now, when people have coronary artery bypass surgery, which I had a few years ago, as soon as I had my chest pain, I was looking for my photon stimulator because I knew that that would be something that would help people with angina. And I thought, well, if this is what that was, I want to do it. And as it turned out, I had to have a triple bypass. And the day before surgery, I put that light on my chest over the heart. And after surgery, did the same thing. And what does the data show in people who do this very same thing? And it's published in a, in a medical journal. It shows that the enzyme levels don't rise if you do this like they do if you don't do it. So it's, it's, it's something that is in need of more study, but doctors are, are beginning to know about it. Then there are some miscellaneous conditions that you can treat. I told you that you could treat the eye with light. And in this case, we got the idea from this. And there were some rats that were poisoned with methanol. And when you do that, they go blind. That's just what, what alcohol does. And, and the reason they do is because it, it kills a very important enzyme there that's in the mitochondria, that's the energy producing part of the cell that makes it impossible for the, the, you to be able to see. Now, if you treat these, uh, 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 these people with light, after you have poisoned them at 5, 25, and 50 hours, they hardly go blind. A lot of them don't go blind at all. So we know it has an effect on the eye. And as I told you, I've treated probably a dozen people, maybe, maybe two dozen people over the last 20 years who've had problems. The last one I can remember was a woman in her late 50s or 60s who couldn't read the E on the chart. She had had multiple surgeries on her eye and she was really sad about what she had. And I said, well, if you want to try it, I, I don't think this will hurt you. And, and it may do some good. And she thought about it and said, well, I haven't got much to lose. Well, over the course of the next day or two, she could read down two lines. And I got the biggest hug from that. And of course, both of us were in tears because we couldn't believe that we had done something that was that impressive. And now there's a lot of literature that looks at this and is supporting its use in the eye to, to restore vision and to uh, treat things like a macular degeneration that's dry or to, uh, to treat a glaucoma or other conditions like that. And there are many dental applications that you can use too. Things uh, like TMJ problems, you have jaw pain uh, that's uh, painful and you have to wear bite plates. And most of those people we can treat in three or four minutes uh, for three or four days in a row and it disappears. And then there are other things like Bell's palsies and trigeminal neuritis, neuritis and many other oral things that we have had good anecdotal responses to. For soft tissue injuries, it's, again, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. Uh, for sports injuries, uh, people with tennis elbows, I've had plenty of tennis elbows myself, and I, don't, I, I didn't travel to tennis tournaments without taking my photon stimulator with me because I knew that if something went wrong, I probably would be able to recover from whatever happened over the course of a, a few hours or the next day. And what I have here is a picture of somebody. You can see all the red in the arm of somebody who has a tennis elbow. And the picture on the, on the right side of the screen shows the tennis elbow uh, having been treated in just 15 minutes. Now, it took a week to treat that every day to keep it from happening. And it took a tennis lesson to teach her how to hit the ball right, too. <laughs> now, uh, Gary Null has been seeing the work that we have been doing for the past no, four or five years. We probably made, what, five or six treatments there? Yeah. Something like that. And he's videoed some of the work we've done. We had two patients who had neuropathy, one in a wheelchair and one in a walker, uh, older people. And we interviewed the people and we sh did the treatments on camera to show what we did. And in a period of two days, the man in the wheelchair went to the walker and the man in the walker was walking around normally. And both of them were the, without pain, and the numbness was improved, their balance was improved, their strength was improved. And we also treated a, a couple of people with Alzheimer's that he has also had testimonials from that showed the same thing. But it's not just us. There's all kinds of, of uh, things that are happening with uh, light that's being published now in the main, main journals that is uh, telling us uh, what's happening. That I just have so much respect for you, Maurice, for having had the patience to deal with a newbie who didn't know much about light therapy at all, but at least had the, the willingness to listen to what you had to say. And it's changed how I practice medicine almost completely. 
aside from the spiritual stuff, which I think is even more important than light, and you do too, uh, this is a technology that needs to be brought forward. The research is there. Uh, there are studies coming out of major institutions all over the world. And I think the time is right for us to take this to the next step. So we're both in great appreciation for having the opportunity to present this on such a large scale uh, to the people of the Commonwealth Club. I have one thing to say. I want to tell you what kind of person Dr. Saputo is. Uh, uh, several years ago, I went over to his office on Saturday because he spends his Saturday, Sundays, and evening evenings treating people that uh, that have limited resources. And uh, when I stepped in the door, he told me, he said, you know, Maurice, I'm, this is a low point of my life. And I said, well, how, what's that? And he said, I have to pay people to come here to be treated. <laughs> I treat them free, but I still have to pay them. And I said, how's that? And he said, well, there's a person that uh, was going to take BART over and he had enough money to come over on BART, but he didn't have enough money to get back. I said, well, what did you do? He said, I gave him a $20 bill. So now I'm paying patients. <laughs> So that just tells you what kind of a doctor Dr. Sabuto is. Well, we, we have had an opportunity that is absolutely remarkable because we're entering a new era of medicine. And this era is going to be punctuated with a kind of success we've, we've never seen before. We're not into biochemistry as much now when we start talking about biophysics. The bioenergetics of how the body works has a template that regulates the biochemistry of the body. And there's nothing wrong with using drugs and, uh, and nutrition and other things that affect our biochemistry. They're very important. But it's even more important that we go to the root cause of what's happening. And of course, that's biophysics. Unless you want to go deeper to the spiritual aspect of why people get sick and have the problems that they have, because that's the original thing, in my opinion. After practicing medicine for 55 years, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of what I learned in medical school was interesting, important information, but it was only the start. It was the tip of the iceberg. It's what gave us the wisdom to be able to move forward uh, and learn on our own. And I've done that because I, I care about how people feel and, and, uh, and about their suffering. And that's why we've gotten into this whole idea of integrative medicine, of somatic therapies, which we'll, we'll hear about in another presentation here at the Commonwealth Club soon, and about the holistic nature of how we are, how we operate as people, as a humanity. So I want to turn the meeting back over to, to uh, Robbie uh, Kilpatrick now, and I want to thank Maurice for participating in this. Thank you, Len. Um, you know, Greetings and thank you, our audience, for attending today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Robert Kilpatrick, chair of the club's Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum and chair of this program. And I'd like to thank Dr. Len Saputo and Maurice Bales for this incredibly interesting program. I mean, I learned so much today. And what I liked most about it was that you brought innovative science to the public. Lots of studies, lots of science, and yet I understood the vast majority of it. And I got a glimpse of what you refer to, Len, as new frontiers in medicine. And certainly that's something that we'd like to see more of at the Commonwealth Club of California. Well, during the COVID times, the club is presenting all of our programs digitally. And therefore, I must say we welcome your financial contributions. Please make a donation on the club's website so that we can have exciting programming like we had today from Dr. Saputo and Mr. Bales. You can go to the website at www.commonwealthclub.org and any amount of money helps us. Now, this program of the Commonwealth Club of California commemorating more than 116 years of enlightened discussion is adjourned. Thank you and come again. Bye.